It's always a question, isn't it, of definition. Um, I, I think that there's a tension going on here. And the way I nowadays look at it is the tension between, if you like, the structural factor, that is, the, the framework of international politics, if you like, geopolitics. Uh, and uh, at the same time, on the other side, the tension between systemic issues, that is, the nature of the regime, the quality of social and political relationships within the system. So, uh, in t so externally, it's really tough, clearly, with sanctions regime and with everything else going on. Uh, at the structural level, we've got a breakdown going on. Obviously, Russia uh, not isolated, its economy is not in tatters, but nevertheless, it's tough times indeed with uh, declining economic performance, um, relative isolation, and certainly uh, a consolidation of the Atlantic Alliance against Russia now. Uh, this morning, you may have seen uh, um, Jean-Claude Juncker, the uh, president of the European Commission, was calling for the creation of a European army uh, to deal with the Russian threat. So at the structural level, uh, you could say that, uh, that Putin's leadership in the third term has led uh, Russia into an extraordinarily difficult position, not unlike that after the Crimean War in the 1850s uh, and into the 60s. However, However, a, a, a contrary view would argue that, uh, well, what on earth else could Russia do? You've had NATO enlarging up to its borders. You've got a very, very aggressive language within NATO by the new members, that is the Baltic states, Poland, and, of course, the United Kingdom. So uh, what, what is Russia supposed to do? As, uh, as, they were, as the joke goes, uh, Russia gives and the West takes. And the more Russia gives, the more the West takes. They're, my argument is, Everyone is at fault on a structural level. It's been a disaster. 25 years of sleepwalking into this disaster. 25 years of living in the fool's paradise. I've been one of the few arguing this for many, many years. There are a few others who um, the world have been saying the same sort of thing. This is just simply, Russia does have some national interests. Even in the best of circumstances, it does have geostrategic concerns. How it manages them is a different question. And has Putin managed them best? Probably not, but uh, Putin or Schmutin, as we say, I'm not sure that the, the and Yeltsin, of course, uh, raised these exactly same issues. On the other side, in systemic terms, we have the continuation of the stalemate. Uh, you could say, uh, as I argue in my paper, that Putin delivered substantive public goods in his first two times, then two terms, then his uh, choice of Medvedev as interim president, or certainly uh, president, outlined a program of substantive political reform, which could, if they'd been allowed uh, their own dynamic and autonomy, have allowed these systemic stalemates to be transcended. And what sort of stalemates do I mean? There's a political stalemate with a regime claiming effective dominance over the electoral and competitive party system. You have a, an economic stalemate, of course, because uh, it's quite clear that we haven't got a dynamic uh, self-sustaining uh, model of economic growth, investment has declined, and so on. And there's also an ideological stalemate, which I really do think we shouldn't forget. The ideological stalemate is, is that it's quite clear that that model of neoliberal capitalism, which Putin espouses, by the way, even though he's a bit top-down and statist and so on, nevertheless, that model itself doesn't have widespread popular support within Russia. There's huge constituencies opposed to it. And these are not just ideational constituencies, these are social constituencies. These are workers in those monotowns. This is officialdom, the great army of, uh, of the civil service and uh, other bureaucrats. And of course, the vast security apparatus, the ramified one, accompanied on the other side by the emergence of what you could call the middle class or a, uh, the creative classes. But it's a stalemate. No one wins, and the genius of Putin is to keep all this in balance. The downside of Putin is that it allows none to, to win, but it just means we have this continued, I won't use the word stagnation, but certainly drift. It's always a question, isn't it, of definition. Um, I, I think that there's a tension going on here, and the way I nowadays look at it is the tension between, if you like, the structural factor, that is, the, the framework of international politics, if you like, geopolitics. Uh, and 
at the same time, on the other side, the tension between systemic issues, that is the nature of the regime, the quality of social and political relationships within the system. So, uh, in t so externally, it's really tough, clearly, with sanctions regime and with everything else going on. Uh, at the structural level, we've got a breakdown going on. Obviously, Russia uh, not isolated, its economy is not in tatters, but nevertheless, it's tough times indeed with their declining economic performance, um, relative isolation, and certainly uh, a consolidation of the Atlantic Alliance against Russia now. So it's quite clear that uh, this, uh, after the Donbass, after the Ukrainian events, the conservative traditionalists of one form or another have uh, gained uh, wind in their sails with the Zborsky Club and so on. Uh, on the other side, how sustainable, how tenable it is, uh, we do have to say that in the last two and a half decades, Russia has undergone significant social modernization. And it's a modernization which is both social but also political in terms of aspirations. All public opinion polls until recently have put democracy, surprisingly enough, even though we talk about how democracy was discredited in the 1990s. Nevertheless, these polls show a commitment to genuinely competitive multi-party elections, a more independent parliament and so on. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a backlash at the moment because the West really has driven Russia in a corner. And I think whenever Russia is driven into a corner, you have popular consolidation and elite consolidation around the leadership. That's normal. That's to be expected. How how fragile or how, how sustainable that is, I, I really think that's the major question. Uh, one point to finish here is to say, just how strong is the opposition? Well, it's quite clear in all the discussion with uh, uh, Nemtsov's uh, murder that it's relatively marginal. However, we did see between 50 and 70,000 people march uh, to pay respects for Nemtsov, many of whom, and I know some of these people, were his political opponents. I thought it was actually very moving uh, for the march uh, last weekend to have all those people out there, uh, many of them, with, and I was uh, in Brussels at the time, his deep ideological opponents, still wore a black ribbon. And that shows that his high sense of civic, if you like, engagement and responsibility. So I, I think that any backward-looking, you know, total, um, you know, a consolidation on the basis of a conservative traditionalist model uh, is unsustainable as well. No, if you look, I, I've traveled quite a lot around uh, um, Russia. And, uh, well, I mean, uh, if you just mentioned Yekaterinburg, you mentioned Tomsk, uh, Rostov, even there. Uh, it's th this, there's a huge, and Kazan even. Uh, no, there's a huge potential uh, in these major cities. And indeed, you know, obviously small towns have their own specific political dynamics. But it, it's, it's uh, it, but can I just stress? This is that what I'm talking about, civic patriotism, if you like, is not simply a Western centric phenomenon. This is a genuine liberal liberalism, if you like, in inverted commas or democratism, a la Russe. And it has to be. And I anticipated that Mikhail Borisovich Podarkovsky would be somebody who would be able to articulate these uh, aspirations, which I think are deep and widespread through society. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, he's aware of the issues. He has tended uh, lately to restrict himself to the westernized liberal uh, segment, which uh, is rather irreconcilable. Um, he himself understands the larger issues. As we spoke with him, he was in London uh, last week, and I think he's well aware that uh, of the dangers of simply becoming an instrument of the neocons and the liberal uh, internationalists out of Washington, if I may. Put it like that. Yep. No. Very good question. We, you know, you, we've talked about this endlessly. We don't get very far in giving answers. Uh, one thing I did notice the other day is that in Gorbachev's interview uh, last uh, October in Russia's Gazeta, Russia Beyond the Headlines, 
He reminded us that the 1990 Charter of Paris for a New Europe did actually suggest the establishment of a European Security Council. And that really would have been a good idea, to manage precisely these conflicts and contradictions. So, uh, in part, one reason why we've got into this state of hostility and warfare is, uh, and I don't, you know, it's, America bashing is too easy, and I certainly don't want to indulge in that gratuitously. Uh, but we have to say that, you know, Russia, as you know, in the early 2000s, did try and started negotiations informally to join NATO, uh, and then it was vetoed by Washington. He said, you know, it would mean changing, indeed, the nature of NATO, um, but it would also, as the Chinese say, uh, there can only be one tiger on the mountain, and we know who that tiger is at the moment. Uh, but it, it's quite clear that something needs to be done. And so, yes, can the Europeans do it on their own? No. Has, it has to be done with Washington. It has to be done with a real revision, I mean, really a review of the strategic challenges. Unfortunately, we're going in the exact opposite direction, the consolidation of a new Cold War, the consolidation of a new Iron Curtain. So I think that we're not even talking about a, a new European security treaty. We're talking about some sort of restoration of dialogue and diplomacy, back channel, third, uh, you know, whatever channel, somehow or other, we've just simply even got to get back to the status quo ante of discussion and debate, and even a little bit of trust, if I may be so bold. I mean, Russia will be fine. I mean, in economic, I, I, I think that um, at the moment, obviously, things could get worse. But uh, in terms of purely economic management, the in Russia's economic indicators, obviously, declining growth and stagnation and so on. But in purely financial reserves, the budget uh, surplus, even now, uh, the uh, and all those other factors, uh, no. I mean, oil will go up. I mean, at the moment, already you're talking about uh, Saudi Arabia preparing to raise, uh, to reduce supply, and so on. So it's not that. Of course, the big question is, we're, 2016 is a new Duma election, 2018 the presidential elections. Uh, a fourth term for Putin? Well, it's at the moment, of course, opinion polls strongly in favor. So this third term of Putin is, in a sense, uh, a lot of chickens are coming home to roost, but none of them are being cooked, if I may put it so crudely. Um, I mean, the, Russia can stagger on uh, for a long time, but really, it's, it's in many ways, this stalemate in which Russia finds itself, it, it's terribly frustrating for the West, it's terribly frustrating for active inter intellectuals and dynamic business people within Russia, but at least it provides, well, I, I was going to say a breathing space, but ultimately, there has to be a vision for the future. and a vision for the future, something that Putin is unable to articulate. So we do need a change of leadership or a change of Putin's orientations. I do believe that the system itself, which he has built, has an evolutionary capacity. Medvedev demonstrated that, but uh, Medvedev's leadership is. Um, but whether they seize this opportunity, I don't know.